Uh, let's have a hand for John Salza. Thank you. I would like to thank, first of all, Dr. Sengenis for the invitation to speak today and for his tremendous research in this area. He is a pioneer, and, and uh, I'm privileged to share some of the fruits of that research today. Before I get into the topic, uh, I would like to make some preliminary but important comments, because this topic is not merely about cosmology. No, this topic is about the very authority of the Roman Catholic Church and ultimately Jesus Christ himself. For it was Christ who promised to leave us an infallible church that would guide us into all truth. And certainly, this promise would have extended to the simplest of questions. Does the earth move or doesn't it? Is the earth the center of the universe or isn't it? If the church got this question wrong, then what are we to make of Christ's promise? When I entered the field of Catholic apologetics over 10 years ago, it became evident to me very early on that I needed to deal with the Galileo case in defending the church, because both Protestants and Catholics would use it to discredit the magisterium for their own personal interests. For example, the, the Protestant would correctly say that the church condemned heliocentrism with its full authority, and then it would say that now science has proven that the earth moves, therefore the Catholic magisterium is bogus. We can't trust anything that comes out of it. And unfortunately, many Catholics have bought into that logic, and they use it to disobey the magisterium on teachings such as contraception and homosexuality and so forth. The Protestant will also say uh, that the church has condemned heliocentrism based upon its literal interpretation of scripture, and that's true. But then they say that now science has proved the earth moves, that the church's hyper-literal approach to scripture, her entire hermeneutic, is false. And think about the stakes of that. The church's core dogmas are based upon the plain meaning of scripture, and we can mention many scriptures. Baptism saves. This is my body. This is my blood. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Whose ever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whatever you bind or loose on earth is bound or loosed in heaven. Now, Catholics take a little bit different tack, and unfortunately, today's Catholic apologists, many of them fall into this category, not wanting to criticize the church's literal interpretation of scripture. They will simply say that geocentrism isn't a matter of faith. They'll say that this is simply anecdotal information that comes from the creation account, and the creation account is a matter of faith. Well, before I demonstrate how erroneous and ignorant that statement is, Let's talk about the creation account, because it certainly gives them some problems. For God reveals in Genesis that he created the earth on the first day, and he didn't create the sun and the moon and the stars until the fourth day. And he did that. He created those heavenly bodies to adorn the earth, to give the earth light, to mark its seasons, and so forth. And it would be illogical to conclude that God would mark the earth as the center of the universe on the first day, it being the first thing created in the temporal order, only to then move the center of the universe to the sun or some other heavenly body on the fourth day. So is the creation account a matter of faith? Well, I'm going to give you a number of reasons why it is. I mean, from the creation account, we get the doctrine, for example, of ex nihilo creation, that God creates something out of nothing. We get the doctrine of man's ontological dignity, that he's created in God's image and likeness with an intellect and a will. We get the doctrine of marriage. We get the doctrine of the fall, of original sin. The Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, where God promises to send a Messiah to redeem us from that sin. Scripture itself in both the Old Testament, in Exodus 20, and in 2 Corinthians 4, and in Hebrews 4, 4, appeals to the creation account as true history in a matter of faith. And all the church fathers and the medieval theologians considered it a matter of faith. So did the popes, Pelagius I, Leo XIII, Pius XII, and councils such as Lateran IV and Cologne and Vatican I, St. Pius X's Biblical Commission in 1909, which bound the conscience of Catholics, considered it a matter of faith. And remember that the church defines faith as an assent of the intellect to truths that God has revealed. Well, geocentrism and the creation account are truths that God has revealed in Scripture, and hence they're a matter of faith. And this is why the 17th century magisterium condemned heliocentrism as heretical, a heresy 
is the denial or doubt of a truth which must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. And so after these apologists admit that this is a matter of faith, he will inevitably resort to saying the 17th century condemnations are not infallible. We can simply ignore them. And then they point to Vatican I's teaching in Pastor Eternus, where the, the council said that the Pope speaks infallibly when he issues a statement ex cathedra, or when he approves a truth dogmatized by an ecumenical council. And then he'll say that the condemnations in the 17th century don't meet those criteria. Now, I'd like to, but I'm not going to take up that debate here, but if Pope Urban VIII's condemnation in 1633 was intended to bind the universal church, then there certainly is an argument that that was an ex cathedra statement. Why? Because in the condemnation, he says that he's invoking the supreme and universal jurisdiction, his authority over the church. He says that we declare and define, we meaning the papacy, him and his predecessors. We declare and define heliocentrism, the propositions of it, as contrary to scripture and formally heretical. But here's the catch. And I don't hear any of these Catholic apologists talking about this. Vatican I also teaches in its constitution, De Filius, that when a doctrine of the church is held throughout time and space by all, always, and everywhere, that teaching is infallible. Why? Pope Leo told us in his great encyclical, Providentissimus Deus, where something is held by all, always, and everywhere, it means that it came from Christ and the apostles. That's the formula. It comes from St. Vincent in his Comanatorium. Geocentrism is such a teaching. And remember the Holy Councils of Trent and Vatican I. They declared that where the fathers are unanimous in their interpretation of Scripture, we are not at liberty to depart from it. We're bound by it. Geocentrism is such a teaching. And there are many more much more support patristically and scripturally for geocentrism than many other dogmas of the Catholic faith. Certainly the Immaculate Conception, the Assumption of Our Blessed Mother, even doctrines that Protestants accept, Christological doctrines, let's say, the two wills of Christ, the two natures of Christ. And so this puts Catholics who purport to follow tradition into quite a quandary. For by rejecting geocentrism, they are rejecting a truth revealed by scripture, unanimously supported by the fathers and backed by the universal and ordinary magisterium of the Catholic Church. And this also means that Catholic apologists who reject or avoid a defense of geocentrism must reconsider their position. Indeed, as Catholic apologists, we must sacrifice ourselves for the truth, not the truth for ourselves. Now, let me cover some rules of exegesis and biblical interpretation that's going to govern our study. First, remember that inerrancy applies to all of the scripture, not just whether it deals directly with a matter of salvation, but whether it's about geography or history or mathematics or science, that information is inerrant. Why? Well, Trent and Vatican I teach us that the very words of scripture were dictated by the Holy Ghost to the sacred authors. Pope Leo XIII confirms the same in Providentissimus Deus. And I can go on and on, pope after pope, who have reaffirmed that teaching. Now, there's this trite expression out there. The Bible <laughs> teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Some people even attribute that quote to St. Augustine, who never said that he was an avowed geocentrist. But is it true? Is that statement true? Well, on the one hand, it is true that Scripture doesn't give us all the minutia of how the heavens goes because if it did, we wouldn't understand it. But that doesn't mean that when scripture touches upon science, it's not giving us truthful and accurate information. In fact, I would say that that statement is false, and we're gonna see that today. Scripture does teach us how the heavens goes. For example, it does teach that the sun revolves around the earth in an annual orbit. Now remember also that scripture itself teaches that it is inerrant when it's giving us scientific information. For example, listen to what Solomon says in the Book of Wisdom. He says, For it is he who gave me unerring knowledge of what exists to know the structure of the world and the activity of the elements, 
the beginning and the end and middle of times, the alternations of the solstices, the changes of the seasons and the cycle of the years, the constellation of the stars. I learned both what is secret and what is manifest, for wisdom, the fashioner of all things, taught me. So when scripture teaches about the structure of the world, it reveals that it is giving us unerring knowledge. Second principle is that we interpret the scriptures in their literal and obvious sense unless the interpretation is untenable or necessity requires otherwise. In other, in other words, there must be definitive proof that the literal interpretation is incorrect, otherwise we're bound to it. Why? Because God is the primary author of scripture. And we know in scripture, he, Titus 1, 2, Hebrews 6, 18, God can't deceive us. He can't lie. And so when scripture says, let the rivers clap their hands, there's definitive proof that the river doesn't have hands. So we know that's metaphorical. But when Christ said, this is my body, science can't disprove that the bread and wine don't become the body and blood of Christ. In fact, Eucharistic miracles prove that to be the case. But the point is science can't disprove that. It can't explain it either. But science can explain how the earth can be and is the center of the universe. And because there is no definitive proof that it isn't, then we're bound to interpret the scriptures literally which say that the earth does not move. Third principle is contextual exegesis. When we read scripture, we're required to assert only what is asserted, and we're supposed to read scripture both in its immediate context and in the context of the entire Bible. And so, for example, if a passage is giving us information about a certain aspect of cosmology, let's say about the sun's heat, then we conclude that the passage is also giving us factual information about another aspect of cosmology. For example, the Earth's position in the universe. Contextual exegesis requires that. Also, we're going to see some scriptures would say that the Earth does not move, and then others that say that the Earth does move or quake. You have to read those passages in the context of the entire scriptures, and we'll see. We know from experience and from science that when the Earth quakes, it happens in an earthquake. And so those scriptures that deal with the earth movement moving deal with the internal structure of the earth, not the external position of the earth. You'll see that when we come to it. It's also important with contextual exegesis uh, to remember that sometimes scripture compares these attributes to the earth to God. For example, God's unmoving position in the heavens, his unerring judgment, and compares it to the earth's immovable position in the universe. And then finally, this language of appearance. You know, our opponents will say all of these verses really deal with metaphors and phenomenal language, and what do we say about that? Well, as we will see, those verses that deal with the Earth's position have all been interpreted literally by the fathers and by the popes. Now, it is true that Scripture does use phenomenal language. For example, Scripture will say that the sun rises and the sun sets, and it doesn't literally rise or, or set. So what do we do with that? Remember that the metaphors that scripture uses, they point to underlying realities. So if scripture says the sun rises or sets, that's a metaphor for the truth that the sun moves. Scripture never says that the earth moves in an orbit or rotates. And so phenomenal language does nothing more for heliocentrism than it does for geocentrism. Phenomenal language can apply to both systems. And why is this proper exegesis important? Well, St. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3.16, he says, the ignorant and unstable twist the scriptures to their own destruction. That Greek word for destruction refers to nothing less than eternal condemnation. And so fundamentally, faith in the church's interpretation of scripture is a matter of salvation or damnation. And that, of course, is why our Lord gave us the church. Now, let's move into scripture. I briefly mentioned the creation account, so I want to start with Joshua, the book of Joshua, Joshua's long day, chapter 10. You recall that Joshua was leading the Israelites in a battle against the pagan Amorites. He, he was doing well, uh, but because he was fighting five different armies, he recognized the time was running out. He needed more daylight to finish the job. And so he calls upon God to stop the sun to give him more daylight. And the scripture says, then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day that he delivered the Amorite in the sight of the children of Israel. And he said before them, Move not, O sun, toward Gibeon, nor thou, O moon, toward the valley of Ajalon. And the sun and the moon stood still. They stood still in the midst of heaven. 
There was not before or after so long a day. Now, remember that the book of Joshua is devoted to recording actual historical events in Israel. And if you go back and read the passage, the specificity evidence is that. For example, there are five different distinct places mentioned in the passage, all within like a 15-mile radius. And so it's recording actual events. The other thing you'll notice is that we're dealing here with divine intrusions, that God is involved in effect, affecting the miraculous here, a departure from natural occurrences. God first sends these, these Amorites into a panic in their minds, and then he whips down these large, massive hailstones to slaughter them. And then we read in verse 13 that God stops the sun. It says that the sun stood still. Now, this word daman in the Hebrew always refers to a word that ceases the action of an object in view. So you have to ask what the action is in order to understand how to interpret that word. And so what is the action here? It's movement. Joshua says, move not, O sun, nor thou, O moon. And so there is a literal cessation of movement here of both the sun and the moon. This is the key fact, I think, the cessation of the moon's movement. That is devastating to the heliocentric position. Why? Well, the moon is not relevant to Joshua's objective of gaining more daylight because the moon doesn't give light. It only reflects it. And it's almost as if God was preempting the heliocentric position by inspiring Joshua to request the moon to stop and then stopping it. Because if only the sun were involved in stopping, then the heliocentrist could say, well, the earth simply stopped in its rotation. And that's why the sun appeared to stay in the midst of heaven. But that didn't happen. Scripture tells us that the sun stood still above Ajalon for an entire day. And we know that from history that that was only about a 15-mile parcel of real estate. And so if the earth stopped its rotation, the moon would have continued in its orbit well past Ajalon. But Scripture says that it stopped there for an entire day. In 48 hours, it would have been long gone. And of course, it would also be contradictory to say that the moon literally stopped, but the sun figuratively stopped. There's an inconsistency there. So either the sun is revolving around the earth or the earth is revolving around the sun. The two both can't be true. And here's a revelation that says, which is true? The sun goes around the earth. Now, this was such a miraculous event that it's recorded throughout Scripture. For example, in Habakkuk 3.11, which was written hundreds of years after Joshua, it says that the sun and moon stood still in their habitation. Now, there's some exegetical tidbits here in this verse, because if we look at uh, the sun and the moon, they're both used in singular. There's no conjunction between them. They're really viewed as a unit. And the verb that applies here, amad, is also in the singular, and habitation is in the singular, which reveals that the divine action is applying to both bodies as a unit. Both the sun and the moon literally stopped. Ecclesiasticus in 46 verses 3 5, which was written well after Joshua, maybe a thousand years after Joshua, again records uh, the event. Was not the sun held back by his hand and did not one day become as long as two? We see the same thing in 2 Kings 20 and Isaiah 38 and 2 Chronicles. So Joshua's long day is compelling scriptural evidence for the geocentric theory. Psalm 19. Let's go to Psalm 19, and if you're using a Vulgate translation, Dewey Reams, I think it would be 18, the beginning verses 1 through 7. David says, and this is again about the motion of the sun, He hath set his tabernacle in the sun, and as a bridegroom coming out of his bride chamber, hath rejoiced as a giant or a strong man to run the way. His going out is from the end of heaven, and his circuit even to the end thereof. Now you see this terminology of motion here of running, of coming, of going out, of circuiting, all images of effort-bearing motion. And as I reflected upon this passage, I thought, you know, why this language of effort? And it's almost as if God is giving the psalmist a knowledge of physics here, that the small object is supposed to go around the larger object. But from the psalmist's perspective, which was the earth, which is the focal point of the vision of the revelation, he's seeing the sun go around the earth. And that's why there's this language of effort. It would only make sense in the context of a geocentric cosmology. Now, the heliocentrist would say, well, so what? The sun moves. We all agree. Well, Scripture says how the sun moves in this verse. It says that the sun moves in a circuit. 
there's a Hebrew word here, tekufa, referring to this time span of one year. And we see this elsewhere in Scripture. For example, in Exodus 34.22, the year's end. 2 Chronicles 24.23, the end of the year, and so forth. So in the heliocentric model, the sun travels throughout the galaxy once every 250 million years. Okay, it can never satisfy Scripture's prescription here for a sun revolving in a circuit, an annual orbit. Of course, this only is true in a geocentric cosmos. We also know that the scripture here is, is revealing scientific facts, such as day and night, and no one can hide from the sun's heat and so forth. Because these are scientific facts, we then conclude that the revelation of the sun's circuit, its orbit, is also a scientific fact. Contextual exegesis requires that conclusion. Now, this verse was so problematic for Galileo uh, that he didn't know what to do, and so he said this verse only applies to the sun's light, but not to the sun itself. Now, of course, that's an example of eisegesis. I mean, the, the passage never mentions the sun's light, and there are other problems. The sun doesn't move with any difficulty. It moves instantaneously, you see. So Galileo was making it up as he goes along. There's nothing about the sun's light that proceeds with any effort or in a circuit of time. It's instantaneous. Maybe that led to his rejection of heliocentrism, which popular science, of course, has hidden from the public for hundreds of years. The next verse is Ecclesiasticus 43 at the beginning, starting at verse 1. Again, about the motion of the sun. The sun, as it goes forth, it parches the land. Who can withstand its burning heat? It burns the mountains. It breathes out fiery vapors. It brightens beams. It blinds the eyes. Great is the Lord who made it. At his command, it hastens on its course. Again, language of motion going forth, hastening on its course or circuit, annual revolution. Science, again, parching the land, giving off burning heat, breathing out vapors, and again the moon, seasons, giving light, has phases, it shines forth. If all these are scientific facts, then we must conclude that the sun's orbit, which is an annual orbit, as scripture reveals, also must be a scientific fact. And this is relevant in history, because Ecclesiasticus was probably written around 150 to 180 B.C., uh, before Christ. And this was at a time where the Greeks were promoting heliocentrism. So God here is giving a revelation at this time directly to rebut them. And let's not forget Our Lady's miracle at Fatima, the miracle of the sun, October 13, 1917. 70,000 people witnessed this. It was recorded by all of the secular historians in the area. The sun left its orbit and spinning fell to the earth only then to recede back to its orbit. This was not the miracle of the earth. This was the miracle of the sun. It wasn't the miracle of the earth because the earth didn't stop rotating or moving in an orbit because the earth doesn't have rotation or move in an orbit. This miracle further supports the geocentric position about the sun's movement against a fixed earth. And again, the sun cannot be revolving around the earth and the earth around the sun at the same time. Now, just as the movement of the sun and the moon are scientific facts as established in scripture, these same scriptures establish the earth's immobility and centrality. And now I'm going to touch on those. First, Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2, and you can see similar uh, revelation in 1 Chronicles 16. The psalm says that the Lord reigns, he's robed in majesty, and the world is established, it shall never be moved. Thy throne is established, thou art from everlasting. Now, contextual exegesis requires us to see that the world and God's throne is being compared. What is God's throne? What's well, his reign, his strength, his power? So the, the psalmist here is drawing a comparison from one truth, which is God's constancy, his power, to another truth, the constancy of the world's position in the universe. Now, this must refer to the world's position in the universe because there are other things about the earth that do move or do change. We talked about the internal structures that may move during an earthquake, or the externals, you know, the, the, the Earth's climate, its temperature, even its geography can change over time. So when scripture says that the Earth doesn't move, it must refer to its position in outer space. That's the only logical conclusion. 
And so this and other verses are expressing the ontological reality of God's position in the heavens and the earth's position in the universe. It's a comparison between what is fixed in the eternal and what is fixed in the temporal. And this makes sense in the context of other scriptures which say that the earth is the Lord's footstool, since footstools are at rest and have something upon, upon them which rests. So, for example, Isaiah 66, 1. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Well, if heaven doesn't move, then the earth doesn't move either. Now, the psalm uses another word for established, kun in the Hebrew. It's used many times throughout scripture and primarily refers to rest or immobility. You might see this in the book of Judges, chapter 16, Samson's reference to the pillars on which the house rests. Now, the heliocentrist will correctly point out that this Hebrew word could also mean shaken. And so they'll point to a verse such as Psalm 82.5, and it says, the foundations of the earth are shaken. Well, we talk about how we have to reconcile these passages. Passages that talk about the earth shaking refer to the internal structure of the earth that moves in an earthquake, while those passages which say that the earth doesn't move must be referring to the earth's external position in the heavens. Psalm 96, verses 9 and 11, again, our Lord reveals, Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. This word for established and immobility, kun again is used in, in, in tandem with mot for moved. And so the Lord's equitable judgment is being compared to the earth's unchanging position in the universe. Now think about it. If the earth were racing around in space, why would the psalmist compare God's judgment to that? Does God's judgment change? No. Why not simply say that the Lord's reign is established or the Lord's judgment is established? Well, to reveal that both God's judgments are fixed and the earth's position in the heavens is fixed. That's why. And clearly, the psalmist had options here. He could have chosen the heliocentric cosmology, but he has to use the correct model to make his comparison work. Otherwise, it fails. And of course, God is the author of Scripture, and he created the correct cosmology, and so he's going to choose the correct model. Now, the heliocentrists will come back and say, well, doesn't the stability simply refer to the Earth's orbit? Again, it's a problem of exegesis because these verses never mention that the Earth has an orbit. No Scripture says that the Earth has an orbit. The other problem is that the psalmist has already compared the stability of the, of the Lord's reign with the orbit of the sun. You see that in Psalm 19. And so since the sun's orbit has been established and both the sun and the earth cannot be rotating around the other, proves that this cannot be about an orbit of the earth, rather about the earth's fixed position in the universe. Let's go to Psalm 104, verse 5. Thou didst set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be shaken. Again, we see here the earth fixed in space. Now, there is a word here for foundations, this, this Hebrew word makon, which is always used. It's used, I think, around 17 times in the Old Testament. And, and, and all of those times except for this instance, it refers to God's immobile position or dwelling place in the heavens. And now this word for immobility is applied to the earth. When we look at scriptures that deal with the earth quaking, a different word is used in Hebrew, Eretz in Hebrew. That was the one that was used in Psalm 82.5 where the earth is shaken. So Psalm 104 again reveals a geocentric cosmology. And it's contrasted in verse 19 with other uh, aspects of geocentrism, such as the motion of the moon and the sun against a fixed earth. It says that thou hast made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun it knows its time for setting. Again, the sun and the moon are always said to move Why a word that means immobility is applied to the earth. In Job 9, verses 6 through 10, we see an earthquake. It says, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun and it does not rise, who stretched out the heavens. Now, this is not describing the orbit of the earth. This is an earthquake. That Hebrew word for landmass here is used, Eretz. It's used in Psalm 82, 5, 99, 1. It's also used a couple times in Isaiah in chapter 13 and 24. 
But in addition to using a word that describes the Earth's landmass, not its eternal or external position in the universe, it also says that the Earth's pillars are trembling. Okay, this also refers to the internal structure of the Earth, since the Earth rests upon these pillars. And during a quake, they shake. They shake the Earth out of its place. Now, this language, out of its place, must mean that the Earth occupies a fixed position to begin with. Otherwise, it can't be shaken out of its place. The scriptures would say it's only shaken out of its pass, path or course or orbit, but not out of its place. There are other scientific facts here in this passage as well. We see references to the stars, the waves of the sea, the constellations, and the quaking earth. So if all of these facts are scientifically true, then the earth's place of rest in the heavens must also be scientifically true. This means that the earth does not have a rotation or an orbit. Again, Psalm 119, verses 89 to 91. Forever, O Lord, thy word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Thy faithfulness endures to all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it stands fast. Another comparison between God and his earth. God's word is firmly fixed and unchanging, and the earth stands fast, which means its position is firmly fixed and unchanging. Now, this Hebrew for stand fast, that word amad, is the same word that is used in Joshua 10 in reference to the sun and moon, which ceased their motion. But there's a distinction here. The amad in this verse, the standing fast in this verse, is said to be established by God, whereas the amad in Joshua 10 was not established. Remember that, that, verb, that word daman referring to cessation of motion. So the motionless of the earth in Psalm 119 is perpetual because it's been established, while the motionless of the sun and the moon in Joshua 10 is temporal because motion ceased. And this literal interpretation is bolstered, bolstered by other descriptions which bracket the verse in question. We see forever, firmly fixed, endures, all generations, and so forth. And so again, the psalmist, by using the fixity of the earth and the universe is comparing it to God's stability, the stability of God's character. And we see the perpetual motionless of the earth even more clearly in this next verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 4 to 7. It says that the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes round to the north. Round and round the wind goes, and on its circuits the winds return. Now again, this affirms the conclusion that the earth stands fast or is motionless. That word remains, again, amad, is the same word used to describe the motionless of the earth in Joshua 10 and Psalm 119. But now, now that word is modified by a word which means forever, olam in Hebrew. This word means literally an unending or indefinite period of time. So look at the continuity here. In Joshua 10, we have a cessation of motion. In Psalm 119, we have the earth being established from the very beginning without motion. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 1, this motionless is unending or for an indefinite period of time. Of course, directly against this backdrop, we see other explicit revelations concerning the movement of the sun and the cosmic winds which turn the universe around every 24 hours. Notice that the wind is described as going round and round, and on its circuits, the winds return. You're going to hear about scientific evidence for these cosmic winds turning the universe. These uh, scientific evidence uh, is also given, as well as revelations, by the blessed Hildegard, which you can read in Dr. St. Genesis' book, and I encourage you to do so. So we have scientific facts here as well, motion of the sun, blowing of the wind, and so forth. If these are scientific facts, then the earth as perpetually motionless must also be a scientific fact. Job 26, verses 7 to 9. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth upon nothing. Again, God is behind all of the actions of the universe. And this phrase, hangs the earth upon nothing, 
but when something hangs, it's not in orbit. It's stationary. And in Hebrew here, there is a participial construction, which means that the hanging represents a continuing action. God keeps the earth continually fixed in space without motion. This hanging upon nothing, this upon nothing, is also a Hebrew word that can mean without. In other words, the earth exists independently of the universe. It's suspended in the center, in the cosmos, in a neutral position, which is really independent of the cosmos. And you'll hear about this. This is the center of mass that Bob was talking about, revealed in scripture, revealed here in Job. And this is how all of the fathers interpreted scripture. The fathers never say that the earth moves, never say that the sun is the center of the universe, never say that the sun does not move around the earth. The fathers always say that the earth does not move. They always say that the earth is the center of the universe. They always say that the sun and the moon and the stars move. And remember what Trent and Vatican I declared. We are not permitted to depart from their interpretation when they're unanimous, and they are unanimous here. Now, it would be redundant for me to go through all of the fathers that talked about the motion of the sun and the moon and the stars. Um, I'll mention a few in alphabetical order. I'll just mention the A's. Ambrose, he acknowledged Joshua's long day. He wrote about that. And he says, the sun travels across the heaven like the stars. Afrahat, in 12 hours, the sun circles round from east to west, the circuiting of the sun there. Athanasius, the sun is carried along and can never go beyond its own orbit, again referring to the sun's circuit. Augustine, in the city of God, referred to the sun's course. In fact, in the Confessions, Augustine says that the sun goes around the earth every 24 hours. And I could go on and on, starting with Basil all the way to Tertullian. I want to get to the fathers, though, that talk specifically about the immobility and centrality of the earth. And I'm only going to give you a brief sampling of this. Okay, but their writings are very, very specific. Anatolius of Alexandria in the Paschal Canon says, the earth is poised in space. In other words, it does not move. Athanasius, the great saint, an enemy of modernism, and against the heathen, he says that the earth is kept in its place, being bound fast at the center of the universe. Athenagoras says that God fixed the earth in its place like a center. Basil inquires about the immobility of the earth, and he says, it is not without reason or by chance that the earth occupies the center of the universe. Do not then be surprised that the world never fails. He says this in his nine homilies, because it occupies the center of the universe. He also says in the mystic meaning of the tabernacle, the earth is placed in the middle of this universe. And in his homilies, he further says, don't try to bother finding out the earth's point of support. He just accepted it as a fact because scripture revealed it. And he also said it's vain to try to even refute the Greeks who are promoting heliocentrism because he says the weakness of their system is sufficient to destroy it themselves. Chrysostom in his homily on Titus says that some people think the earth turns around, but he specifically says it turns not, but stands firm. In his homilies to Antioch, he says that the sun with the rest of the stars runs on its course, but the earth, quote, is fixed. And Chrysostom also writes extensively about Joshua's long day in the geocentric psalms. Clement of Rome refers to the course and movement of the sun, but also says that God has fixed the great world as a center in space, and he spread out the heavens to solidify the earth. Cyril of Jerusalem in his catechetical lectures refers to the sun's cessation of motion in Joshua's long day, and then says that the earth, quote, bears the same proportion to the heaven as a center to the whole circumference of a wheel. Gregory of Nisan, The Making of Man, says the earth and the water took the middle place of the universe, and he also refers to the earth as a creation that do does not move, that it is fixed, it stands firm and unyielding while circling the substance of the universe moves around the earth. And again, Gregory says that the earth is poised in the middle and the motion of all the revolving bodies is round this fixed and solid center. And Gregory of Thermatagos on Ecclesiastes, the verse that we just read, says the earth itself continues stable and the sun accomplishes its circuit about perfectly and rolls round to the same mark again. Now I've only scratched the surface 
And I encourage you to read Dr. Syngenis' book, Galileo Was Wrong, which goes into these verses in great detail, both the Hebrew and the Greek, the original languages. But every father who wrote about the earth in the context of cosmology said that the earth does not move and that it is the center of the universe. You know, our opponents, who are Catholic apologists, want to talk about infallibility. Again, Trent and Vatican I infallibly declared that where the fathers are unanimous in their interpretation of Scripture, we are bound to it. The fathers were way ahead of us. They've already done the work. They already know. And now we're bound to their interpretation. So in closing, let us remind ourselves that the church in these times, these troubling times, is experiencing a crisis, as Our Lady of Fatima foretold. And it's not just a liturgical crisis. It's not just a moral crisis. It is a doctrinal crisis. One of the chief ways that Satan has attacked the church is by attacking biblical inerrancy and the church's traditional method of interpreting scripture. Because if Satan can get people to doubt the word of God, then he will ultimately lead people to deny the word of God, who is Jesus Christ. And this issue has consequences for unbelievers. For if the earth is the center of the universe, then there must be a God who put it there. Because if you consider the dimensions of the universe and the relative position of all the heavenly bodies and the size of the earth, a divine agent would have had to work out all those details. As scripture says, God has arranged all things by measure and number and weight. And so if the earth is the center of the universe, then God is trying to tell us something, isn't he? He's trying to tell us that we're unique, that he loves us, and he calls us to be with him forever. This is why he opens his written revelation with a description of the cosmos. And this is also why the atheists and the agnostics want so badly to disprove geocentrism. Why? Because they think if they can do that, then they can argue that God doesn't exist, or at least that the God of the Catholic faith doesn't exist. And that's because they don't want to be accountable to that God. They don't want to repent and convert. They would rather remain in their sinful lives. That's their motivation. And this results in two more frightening consequences for them. It means that Copernicanism, which was abandoned by Galileo before he died, is one of the biggest deceptions ever perpetrated upon mankind. And it also means that modern man must retool his entire worldview by giving his primary allegiance, not to science, but to the church, the pinnacle and foundation of the truth. So let us then stand with all of the church fathers, with the medieval theologians, with St. Augustine, with St. Thomas Aquinas, and with our holy fathers, St. Pius V, Paul V, Urban VIII, Alexander VII, Benedict XIV, all of whom were confirmed by the Holy Ghost. And with them, let us profess that the God-man, Jesus Christ, has united divinity to humanity at the center of the universe through his incarnation, through his real presence in the Eucharist, and through his church. Thank you. God bless you.